Thank you, sir, for that very nice introduction. And thanks also to all of you for continuing 197 years of fostering active debate. It's my honor to discuss the Trump trade and economic policies as they relate to the global economy. We're often incorrectly blamed for global economic problems. From the late 1980s through the early 2000s, global merchandise export growth was usually double that of world gross domestic product growth. You can see that on the chart here. The red dashes going across are the average of the whole period. So you can see how it peaked. But during the past five years, goods trade growth lagged global GDP growth. That's because globalization had gotten a bit out of control. For example, it takes 200 suppliers in 43 countries on six continents to make one iPhone. Seems a little extreme. Chart two, you can see the demonstration that world trade remains structurally weak. Global trade growth likely turned actually negative in 2019, while GDP did increase by about 3%. And that's the first time the two have moved in opposite directions. The explanation is that auto exports contracted, and that accounted for 30% of the world trade slowdown. Another reason is that intermediate product exports have declined from 54% of the total in 2008 to 52% now. And developing countries had increased their share of value-added international trade from 31% in 2005 to 39% in 2015, but their share of global trade will likely decrease in coming years, due in part to higher wages and shipping rates, and partly due to the Fourth Industrial Revolution, 4IR. 4IR is the expanded analytical capability generated by the 5G Internet of Things. And it is ushering in a new age of productivity, efficiency, customization, and most importantly, sustainability. As a result, exports had peaked as a percentage of global GDP at 26% in 2008. Now, these shifts may not adversely affect total global GDP, but they probably will redistribute it back to the more developed countries. For example, the textile and apparel industry is the largest employer in the world. It employs about 125 million people globally mostly in less developed countries. And that total for textile and apparel, that total employment is more than the combined totals of the automobile and electronics industries. But that industry and others are susceptible to the rapid adoption of four IR digital technologies. The EU, the world's largest goods exporter, made about 34% of total global goods exports in 2018. By comparison, the United States was just 8.8%. But the United States was and is 
the world's biggest importer at $2.5 trillion worth of goods in 2018. That's 50% more than our exports, and it's 15% of total world imports. As a result, in 2018, the U.S. goods trade deficit reached an unsustainable $887 billion. The U.S. runs deficits with almost 100 trading partners, of which China, followed by the EU, Mexico, Japan, and Vietnam are the largest. These five account for 92% of the U.S. trade deficit. Now, free trade folklore says that countries export what they do best, import what they do worst, and internally produce and consume the rest. But that's not how trade really works. The five markets I mentioned and others have tariff and non-tariff trade barriers, and they subsidize their exports. The U.S. is the least protectionist major country, and therefore our trade policy issues are two. First, how much of the 887 billion goods deficit is artificial? And second, how do we reduce these artificial deficits? To answer these questions, we must study history. Right after World War II, the United States had recurring trade surpluses. The U.S. economy was so strong that its leaders decided to help Europe and Asia's fragile economies to recover with direct aid like the Marshall Plan and with trade concessions to help them export to our market. These concessions were later made permanent in the GATT and the World Trade Organization. They remain in effect today, even though some of them benefiting from it are export powerhouses like China, like Germany, and like Japan. It took 25 years for these policies to shift the United States from trade surpluses to deficits. Now, <clears throat> many countries, including China, have a positive balance of trade overall solely because their surpluses with the U.S. exceed their deficits with the rest of the world. Without their U.S. surpluses, they could not buy as much as they do from everyone else. And almost half the U.S. merchandise trade deficit is with China, partly because wages are lower there, partly because we let them into the WTO on the theory that they would obey global trade rules. Unfortunately, China disobeyed the rules and the WTO has no real enforcement mechanism. Therefore, the United States had to defend itself. We have 450 WTO-compliant trade actions in force against foreign exporters. Almost half of those involve China. And just this week, our government subjected currency manipulation to countervailable duties. Artificial devaluation subsidizes exports, but will now be less useful to the perpetrators. But piecemeal trade enforcement is expensive and slow because it requires extensive and detailed analysis of long-term data. And once a case 
is eventually decided, exporters get around enforcement by using slight product modifications or illegal transshipments through ports in other countries. If you doubt the impact of China's WTO entity, then look at this chart. The vertical axis is the date when China entered the WTO. And you can see that before that, its GDP grew slowly. But look what happened after 2001 when it was admitted. The only change was its membership in WTO, not its inherent competitive advantage. Another US mistake was the North American Trade Agreement. Before NAFTA, in, which occurred in 1993, the US had a trade surplus with Mexico of $5 billion in 1992 and in most other years. But after NAFTA's first year, that trade surplus suddenly became a $16 billion trade deficit in goods. It is now over $100 billion annually. And the cumulative trade deficit that the US has with Mexico post-NAFTA now exceeds $1.2 trillion. $1 trillion, 200 billion is a big number, even for the United States. President Trump campaigned against such artificial trade deficits. No country can afford permanent, huge trade deficits. No more than a family can afford increasing credit card debt every year because of excess spending. The US cumulative trade deficit over the last 10 years in goods is $7.7 .7 trillion and cost us millions of good jobs. Now, some economists claim our deficit comes from a savings rate that is lower than other countries. But that doesn't explain the impacts of NAFTA, China's WTO accession, other countries' protectionist policies, or the preferential trade agreement accorded to, believe it or not, 90% of the World Trade Organization's members. It also doesn't explain the fact that under the rules, China can airmail a package to a customer in the United States, that whole huge distance, for far less than it costs for a shorter distance within the US. It's an inadvertent subsidy. It also doesn't explain the impact of subsidized export financing by countries. So in short, the low US savings theory, at best, only partially explains the US trade deficit. President Trump's stated objective is to eliminate foreign export subsidies and all tariff and non-tariff trade barriers. Why then is he imposing some tariffs already and threatening others? Tariffs are his only tool to offset the historic unilateral concessions I described earlier. And they're also the only tool to motivate trading partners to negotiate away some of their artificial advantages. Without tariffs and the threat of additional tariffs, countries would remain with the trade barriers lopsided in their favor. For example, the US tariff on imported autos is 2.5%, but Europe's tariff on 
U.S. made autos is 10% and China's is much higher. Similar ratios are true for other industries. So they would give up their differential only if the cost of not doing so would be even worse, namely higher or additional U.S. tariffs. The fact is, Trump's tariff tactics work, as his phase one trade deal with China proves. China has committed now to buy 200 billion more goods from the U.S. producers over the next two years. This would reduce the U.S. trade deficit by an average of $100 billion per year and would add one half percentage point to U.S. GDP each year. More importantly, China agreed to end forced technology transfers and to show more respect for intellectual property rights. In return, the U.S. agreed simply not to impose the tariffs scheduled for December 15th 2019 and to reduce somewhat the October tariffs. But the U.S. retained 72.5 billion of annual tariffs on some 370 billion of Chinese goods pending further negotiations. Tariff threats also facilitated the new U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement the renegotiation of our pact with Korea, and two new agreements with Japan. Further shifts in global supply chains are occurring due to new U.S. policies regarding regulations and taxes. Deregulation of shale gas and oil has moved the United States from being a net importer a substantial one, to a net exporter of these fuels. It also has created a much larger export business for petrochemicals. In total, the U.S. government has cut out eight regulations for every new one imposed under President Trump. This makes it easier and cheaper to do business in the U.S. The U.S. also went from being one of the highest business tax countries to one of the lowest. But the most important U.S. tax reform was allowing an immediate 100% write-off of capital expenditures, cutting the effective cost of investment by 21%. Nothing improves the rate of return better than lower initial investment. The new U.S. tax code is so effective that one foreign minister threatened to file a WTO complaint that the tax plan constituted an unfair trade practice, if you can imagine. Beyond these policy changes, the shift in global supply chains will be further impacted by the digital technologies of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, 4IR. Historically, production location decisions sought large pools of low-cost, unskilled, and low-skilled workers. Now, almost every day, another breakthrough in robotics is announced. Some machines can even fold garments and insert them into packages. Others can pick up dissimilar components and place them in precise locations, error-free, over and over. The substitution of capital equipment and software for labor will intensify. You can see this chart of labor's share of the economic pie. It has fallen. That doesn't mean that workers are less well off. 
In fact, they're better off, and they're particularly better off in the US. What has happened is the intensity of software and the intensity of capital uh, has increased. And the radical transformation of the global production system is just beginning. Korea is probably the leader in automation technologies, but it still has only 710 robots per 10,000 workers. In the US, there are only 200 robots per 10,000 workers, and our wages are quite a bit higher than Korea's. So logically, we should end up with a much higher ratio. Korea's ratios are also going up rapidly. We in China also need robots to offset some bad demographic trends. You can see the projections of working age population, and it may astonish you as you look out here toward 2050, the gap in total workforce between China and the US is closing because Chinese working age population is declining much faster than that of the US, largely due to the one China policies. <coughs> Manufacturing is 68% of US goods exports. And McKinsey believes that 4IR will increase US manufacturing exports by between 14 and 20% by 2025. McKinsey also projects an amazing statistic. They project that 42% of all occupations are at least 50% automatable. But it's not just robots. For IR, the Internet of Things, and capturing and analyzing vast amounts of real-time data will greatly improve efficiency. Examples abound. 3D printing uses less material, less energy, and less labor. AI-empowered production reduces the time between product design and full production. It also reduces the need for inventory, labor, and its related costs. Meanwhile, the just-in-time economic model of ordering, production, and delivery prioritizes close geographic proximity of factories to their customers and to each other. Finally, the speed of stocking and replenishing products is an increasingly important competitive factor for changing fashions and seasonal styles. Today, retailers must guess well ahead of time the demand for products. This leads to ordering errors, which cause shortages of hot items an excess inventory of others that'll have to be marked down. Quicker turnaround times will reduce both problems. Meanwhile, other factors are also changing global supply chain dynamics. Growing cost pressures on low wage, highly polluted countries give them a competitive advantage. Sustainability is increasingly important to both consumers and global executives, and environmental concerns are beginning to influence supply chain decisions. Manufacturing consumes 54% of world energy and emits 20% of world CO2. Low less developed country environmental spending is a competitive advantage but is degrading the global environment. I doubt 
that the developed world will continue paying twice for improving the environment. First, through higher domestic costs, and second, through job displacement by countries with lower environmental standards. One sign of change is the new maritime industry fuel rules effective this year. Ocean-going vessels must now either use more expensive, lower sulfur fuels or invest capital to reduce pollution from existing bunker fuels. Some countries are considering a carbon tax on imports to offset the disparity in environmental laws and enforcement. Already, there are signs that proximity to customers and to highly skilled workers is shrinking global supply chain. For example, the state of Iowa is almost in the exact center of the United States, not close to either coast. Yet 30% of all greenfield capital expenditures over the last decade came from Germany and Japan. Although international trade accounts for only 11.5% of Iowa's economy. As one can clearly see, fourth industrial revolution technologies and sustainability will do more to transform the $20 trillion in global trade than U.S. tariffs on a few hundred billion dollars of goods ever could. It will disrupt those economies that lack highly trained and highly skilled workers. I now will gladly field your questions on these or other subjects of interest to you. Just please don't make the questions too hard. Thank you. Thank you very much for your remarks. I wanted to start by asking about your blacklisting of Huawei. About, oh, black Huawei, sure. Because the UK recently approved Huawei 5, 5G equipment. Do you think that this was a mistake, and how effective do you think that your blacklisting right. of Huawei has well, been? Well, the UK has approved limited usage of Huawei. I believe they have limited it to 35% of the total equipment. But more importantly, they have said they intend to keep it out of the most sensitive areas. We frankly disagree both with that conclusion and with the underlying premise. Unlike earlier telephonics, 3G and 4G, 5G is much more software intensive, much less equipment intensive. There is no way that we can see to separate core activities effectively from so-called peripheral. So we think they are taking an extreme national security risk, and we hope they will ultimately reconsider the decision as they begin to apply it. Because the problem is, once everything is connected to everything else and to every person, the potential to shut down your whole economy, shut down your whole government, shut down your whole military becomes quite intense. So I make the analogy, if there were a nice new car that you were thinking about buying, but there was a 10% chance you'd be killed the first time you drove it, I don't think you'd buy the car. I promise you there's more than a 10% chance of a problem with this company and with its equipment. You may not be aware, it is the law in China that private companies must cooperate with the People's Liberation Army and with the intelligence apparatus and are prohibited from disclosing that they are doing so. That gives us great pause. So does Huawei's history. If you look at its history of litigation 
fact, we have two indictments pending against them, and that's why the chief financial officer, who's the daughter of the principal shareholder, uh, is awaiting extradition from uh, Canada. Thank you. And why do you think that protectionism and America first policies are the best way to conduct trade policy in a world where global cooperation seems to be more necessary than ever in order to protect the environment? Well, in theory, that's right. The problem is we really are the least protectionist country in the world. So the other countries, the European Union and China, are very good at talking about free trade and very bad at practicing it. They have much higher tariff barriers and much higher non-tariff barriers than we do. Our purpose is to try to relieve those. And we did that with the trade deal with Mexico. We did it with, Can with Korea. We did it with Japan. And we've started doing it with China. That 200 billion extra that we will be selling to China over the next couple of years, the reason we're not selling it to them now is protectionism on the part of China. That's a lot. Do you think that it is necessary for country, not just the US, but countries all over the world then to reduce their protectionist policies in order to work together to combat climate well, change? The, the, the world has been protectionist. The only difference is the one country that had been absorbing as its deficit the cumulative surplus of the rest of the world is now saying enough is enough. And so there's going to be a redistribution of the trade deficit. There's no reason one country should bear that big a trade deficit. And on the subject of trade, how will the U.S. prioritize and negotiate a U.K. trade deal? Ah, well, we're ve we've made no secret. We're very, very eager to make a trade deal with the U.K. And in theory, there should be fewer obstacles to a trade deal with U.K. than to the E.U. Because U.K. economy, like ours, is largely a service economy. And in most big service sectors, there's already quite a lot of integration between UK and US. Uh, second, one of the very big issues that UK has with the EU, they don't have with us. And believe it or not, that's fish. Apparently in Europe, an awfully high percentage of the fish that are consumed in the EU are actually caught in UK waters. So one of the stumbling blocks to their trade agreement is the EU doesn't really want to pay a tariff on fish caught in UK waters. But UK, if it's not part of the, the EU anymore, doesn't quite think that's fair. That's just one example of the kind of unexpected issue uh, that comes up. And are you in favor of the US-China economic decoupling? And what do you think it means for the rest of the world? Well, in a strange way, the new arrangements will bring our economies closer together, not farther apart. And let me explain why that is. The, the past of the world is old industries, like iron and steel, like aluminum, like cars. The new path forward is technology. It disturbs the ability to compete on a technological basis when to do business in a particular country, you're forced to have a partnership, and lo and behold, that partner refuses to join you except if you transfer technology. That's a barrier. It's an unfair barrier. China has agreed to do away with that practice of forced technology transfers. Therefore, that should make it much easier to have interaction between the two as both economies become more high-tech. Similarly, the increase in agriculture 
products that they're buying from the U.S. is simply because they're no longer imposing quotas and tariffs and other restrictions, phytosanitary restrictions, not science-based, on the U.S. So our deal with China, even though the way we got there was through increased tariffs, actually is moving both economies toward lower tariffs and lower trade barriers. Thank you. And moving to, to the US itself, in light of a report from the OECD at the end of last year showing that the US lost more tax revenue than any other developed country in 2018, would you still defend President Trump's 2017 tax cuts? Oh, sure. The reason the U.S. economy is growing so rapidly is in part, as I mentioned, our tax policy and in part our regulatory policy. Tax policy is why the and regulatory is why our economy is the fastest growing large economy compare our recent economic growth to that in Europe, compare our job creation, compare the fact that we have taken seven million people out of food stamps into good paying jobs. Unemployment for Asian Americans, for Hispanic Americans, for African Americans, for veterans and for women is the lowest it's been in 50 years, every single category. That's what we're interested in doing, is creating jobs. And in fact, the biggest problem we have in doing business in America right now is we have to train more workers for more skilled jobs. So the president has set up workforce development practice in the federal government, co-chaired by Ivanka, Trump, and myself, we have gotten hundreds of companies to commit to 14 and a half million apprenticeships and job training opportunities over the next five years. Because to get ready for 4IR and have it work in a fashion that does not create unemployment, but rather upgrades the skills and the pay of people, you have to do more training. And unfortunately, under prior administrations, the US has the least vocational and technical training at the high school level of any OECD country. So you have to look at the policies overall. We are building for the future, and we need to keep the technological leadership, and we need to keep our ability to invent. Um, I recently had the pleasure of signing the 10 millionth patent that the US had issued. Patents come under the Commerce Department. No country in the history of the world has ever issued 10 million patents. And half of those were in the last 20 years, and probably half of that are within the last five or six years. So the pace of technological change is really something we all have to prepare for and make sure that it works to everybody's benefit, not to the detriment. In 19th century England, you had the Luddites who were terrified that, that textile mills were beginning to automate and they were literally breaking into the factories and destroying equipment. Well, guess what? It's why standards of living have gone up, because the more productive a worker can become, the more pay you can afford to give the worker. And lately, productivity in the U.S. has been going up, partly because of our tax policy. It's been going up about 1.9% a year. That's important because you saw the population chart, our population of working age people is not going up very much and eventually will go down some. To grow at 3% a year, you need three things to add at least to 3%. One is workforce aged people, 
that doesn't change much. The second um, is labor force participation. In our case, when we, President Trump came into office, something like 38% of the workers or work age people were not even in the workforce. We've now brought 7 million people in and in the last quarter, over 70% of the new hires came from people who were not in the workforce. That's how you build a country. So I th would urge you, look at the overall policies, look at their effect. And wages for the lowest paid people, namely the non-supervisory blue-collar workers, have been rising faster by a good margin than the compensation of people in the top 10%. We think the best way to reduce inequality of economics is by raising the bottom part. That's much more effective than just taking money away from the people in the higher part, and it does more good. Thank you. And my final question before we take a couple from the audience is, are there any abuses of power for which you think a president should be impeached? Well, I'm not a lawyer, but th there undoubtedly are. Um, in the Clinton situation, he committed an actual crime. The real reason for the impeachment was lying under oath. That's a crime. The Congress has concluded, A, that there was, there was, the House of Representatives did not charge the president with a crime. They charged him with what they felt were impeachable offenses. The vast majority of the Senate disagreed with that, and so that's why he was not impeached. Thank you. Um, we'll move to some questions from the audience now. So if you have a question, please raise your hand in the air, wait for the microphone to come to you, and then stand up while asking your question. Could we go to the hand at the edge of the road there? Yeah, in the coat. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Secretary, for coming here today. Uh, so we spent lots of time learning about uh, trade and about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I guess my question is about your uh, personal career. Uh, so before you started uh, to take this public service role, uh, you spent a long career in the private sector. Uh, I wonder uh, which role do you like better and how did your previous working experience in private sector uh, influence your day-to-day uh, -day, uh, responsibilities today? Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you for a softball question. <laughs> I, I hope that's a trend that everybody else will follow. Um, private sector and public sector, quite different. One thing the president said when he proposed me for the job was he said, Wilbur, you think you did some big deals in the private sector. Big private sector deal is a little tiny thing in terms of public sector, because the numbers are so big. So you have, it's a chance to have more impact. So that's a very good thing. The second very good thing is buried in these gigantic bureaucracies. My department has 47,000 people right now, and we'll have 447,000 by April, because we have to hire 400,000 people to take the census. We take census every 10 years. So got a huge issue of rolling out the census and trying to hire in a very short time 400,000 people. That's a big management challenge. It's a bigger challenge in many ways, especially since we now have over a million more jobs available, not just census, but economy-wide then we have unemployed people. So it's very close to a full employment economy, and that makes it hard to do. So, but that's a challenge, and it's a very interesting challenge. The, the things that are stranger about public sector are two. Private sector, the currency, the motivation for people a lot is pay because the pay structure in private sector is very pyramidal. 
public sector is kind of a very flat, lazy trapezoid. There isn't much difference in pay as you go up the ladder, as I painfully am aware. But what there is, is title. And titles become therefore very, very important. And heaven help you if you get wrong the title of the fourth assistant to the third deputy to the 15th undersecretary of some department. That's real trouble. The other strange thing about public sector is because of the bureaucratic nature of the system, it's very process oriented, whereas private sector is very results oriented. So it's, it's very protective of the bureaucracy to adhere to existing process. Very hard to change process. And then the final thing is, public sector very rarely ever measures results because that's not what they're looking for. I had a theory when I was in private sector, you can't manage something that you don't measure. And that kind of leads us back to the 5G, leads us back to the fourth industrial revolution. The more precisely and the more quickly and the more accurately you can measure things, the better you can manage them. But in government, it's hard to get people to think about measuring results. So programs get started and they kind of take on a life of their own. There's always someone who benefits from a program so they develop advocacy groups in the sector. Very hard to kill a program. Okay, we go to the hand in the red sweater. Um, Sorry, could you just wait for the microphone? Is it me? It is you, but could you just wait for the microphone? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here, Mr. Secretary. Um, you have uh, brought it up in your talk, and I think we can all agree that the economic rise of China has been one of the defining features of uh, our age. Now, there are those in the sort of economic establishment that actually um, urge us to caution in the sense that um, the economic rise of China in terms of GDP may soon reach its inflection point, that um, the return to a focus of SOEs in China and the large amount of international investments with dubious returns as part of the Belt and Road Initiative could mean that um, we are maybe kind of thinking of, we should maybe think of China more as a paper tiger. I'd be really think curious. More of the more, think of China more as a paper tiger and that the inflection point of its economic rise may soon be reached. Now, since apparently the um, awareness of China's rise is informing so much of US policy, I'd be really curious to hear your assessment of that. I'm not quite sure what the question is under there. Do you think China's economic rise um, will soon reach its inflection point and is about to stagnate at some point? Oh, I, I don't think China, China's problems. gonna shrivel up and, and go away. That isn't the, the point of the whole thing. They do have a challenge coming with the declining workforce that will be a very rapid decline uh, starting in a few years. I, you saw that chart. That's a factual challenge. That's something they're going to have to cope with. They're also at some point going to have to deal with the environment. One of the major reasons the U.S. withdrew from the Paris Accord was that it imposed big front-end cash requirements on the U.S., which has already been reducing every year its pollution, and let China pollute without any constraint for quite a few years to come. We think it's, that pollution is a global problem. It's not just a U.S. problem. We think it was an incorrect drawing up of that agreement to give China a free pass for quite a few years. So um, that's another challenge that they're going to have to face is the environmental challenge. And then the final thing is going to be a social safety net. There isn't very much social safety net in China. And that's one of the reasons that the people have to save such a high percentage of their income. So China will have a lot of challenges that are different from the kinds of challenges in some regard 
that the Western world has. Nonetheless, the Chinese are very industrious people. They're very clever people. They're improving their educational system, especially in technology. So they're going to be around. They're going to be major, major players. If I gave you the impression that I think China is going to shrink away and become unimportant, that's not the case, N nor is it anything that we're trying to have accomplished. Could we go to um, the hand there? The one right in front of you, yeah. The black coats. Well, Secretary Ross, thank you very much. It was a um, very interesting talk. So, um, coming from a small Central European country of size of Minnesota, and we talked a lot about major economies. And I would like to ask, because many of us come from such a small countries, how <coughs> small economies can become competitive, kind of uh, having your experience where our small countries are getting closer to the private deals that you have done over your career. So what should we do to stay uh, competitive? That would be my first question. And second, more intellectual. Uh, many politicians in our countries in these days say you should direct the state as a company. Would you agree with this statement? And if yes or no, why not? Who should direct the state? So some people claim, some politicians in Central European region, you should uh, manage the state just as a private company. But do you agree with this assertion? Well, to the degree that that involved the state actually making a profit, I don't think anybody would go along with it. Uh, the state is not a private company. But that doesn't mean that m measurements of performance shouldn't be applied. It doesn't mean that there shouldn't be receptivity to change. So some of the behavior patterns that make well-run businesses succeed, we believe, can be inculcated into the public sector. On the question about small countries versus big, one of the most successful countries in the whole world is Singapore. And it's not a very big country but it made a couple of very, very good decisions. One was, long time ago, it decided to become an important hub for container ships. That really led to a lot of other things. Second thing it did, 80% of Singaporeans are living in what either is or had been public housing. And they have this whole program once you've been there for X number of years, you can get the right to buy it. So Singapore has made some very good, what I would call business decisions, and then on top of that has made some very good public policy decisions. So I don't think being big is necessarily bad. Switzerland, another very successful country, although it's pretty small, Luxembourg, another pretty successful country. I think the trick is country has to figure out what should be its niche and then try to beat that niche to death so that you can really become good at it. UK has a very good history in science, in technology. Therefore, the direction that the world is moving in should be one that has plenty of room for UK to prosper if it will keep up to snuff in the technological uh, side of things. Thank you. And we have time for one final question before we move on. Can we go to the hand over there? Yeah, um, in the middle. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for speaking. Um, my question is in regards to the census. Um, recently, the Supreme Court ruled against including the citizenship question on the census. Uh, why did you think the citizenship question was so important? Well, first of all, many, many countries ask the citizenship question, including the UK, including Germany, including France, including Italy, including Mexico, including Canada, I could go on, including Malaysia. I could go on and on and on. It's not an unusual question to ask, nor had it been unusual historically in the US. Uh, 2010 was the first time that there was no citizenship question in any form. 
So it just seemed to me it was a fundamental thing that had been normal, was done away with for whatever reason. The Supreme Court ultimately disagreed, so the citizenship question will not be on the census that we're uh, about to administer. Thank you so much. That's unfortunately all we have time for today, but please join me in thanking Secretary Ross.